word is shared that we are on holy ground and when we come before you in your presence may we humble ourselves before you giving you the honor and glory and praise we thank you for your love Lord we give this into your hands in Jesus name This morning, our message is called Salvation for All. And that could be, that could be taken several ways, but stay with me before the end. I think when I came up with that title as I was reading through Acts chapter 11, what came out is that God offers salvation to everyone. So when I say salvation for all, that doesn't mean everybody is saved. What it means is it's offered to all of us. So today we're going to start in Acts chapter 11. So if you will, turn to Acts chapter 11. That will be our base camp for the day. And we're going to read through verses 1 through 18. And in the ESV, it says this. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. It was in the city of Joppa. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. It came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times. And all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent or in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go to them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accomplished... Hold on. I apologize. This happened three times, and all was drawn up into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, and you, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on at, at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as, God, as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I 
that I could stand in God's way. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God. Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Everyone. Salvation is offered to everyone. Jews, Gentiles, black, white, brown, yellow, green, purple, I don't care what your color is, Buddhists, Hindus, Islam, Catholics, Christians, Baptists, Pentecostals, atheists, agnostics, homosexuals, lesbians, transgenders, terrorists, murderers, child molesters, even Kanye West is offered salvation. Now don't throw me out with the bathwater yet. If, it's a big word, if, what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Or some of them will say everlasting life. Same thing. Okay? Whoever believes in him. So that means, and which was, this is really kind of cool this week. I saw this um, on uh, an article. Uh, there's a whole group of people who wrestled with homosexuality who turned away from it and got freedom from that. So that means if somebody like who, who wrestles with those things comes to our church, should we judge them? Absolutely not. In fact, they should be welcomed in so that we can share the truth with them. That God does love you right where you're at, but he's not going to leave you there, right? We all have different sins that we, recognize, that we wrestle with. And we do recognize that as a sin. No matter how, much, how you feel, the Bible is clear on that. But it's the same thing, though, if... if Someone is trapped in Islam. Do you know how many people are becoming Christians out of that? Do you know how many salvations are, are, are happening? And they're having, I mean, they're having the kind of transformation that you only hear about. And I'm not just saying praying the prayer. I mean, they are really having a spiritual transformation happen in their life. And they, these guys are actually seeing Jesus like Paul seen Jesus. I've got, I've got several friends who used to be Muslims. Because, I mean, growing up in Grand Rapids, you're gonna, you get a whole big mix of people. And literally, people seeing Jesus is what brought them to follow him. And I don't doubt that for a second. But that's the big if, if you believe. Now, now, some of you are saying, whoever believes in him will not perish. But wait a minute, Pastor Mark, what does James 2, 19 say? So let's jump over there. Remember, base is, we're still in Acts, but we're going to jump around a little bit today. James chapter 2, verse 19 you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So, you believe God is one, good. But even the demons believe that. They shudder. So, demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that. They don't like it, but they don't have any choice but to believe it. Why? Because it's the truth. So there is something we have to do for salvation, right? Do we have to do anything to get salvation? But it's not based on our works, is it? But then what? You ask, then what? Yeah. You ask Jesus into your heart. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you ask him to be the Lord of your life, that's what we have to do. That's it. 
because it's a gift, right? Now let's look at our circumcision party. Now let's get back to our, 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 our verse here in Acts. I lost my verse in Acts. Here it is. All right. So, verse 3. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. How dare you? Hanging out with those uncircumcised Gentiles. What were you thinking, Peter? The Jewish tradition was of purity, made it impossible for any Jew to associate with Gentiles without becoming ritually unclean. Okay? This happened to Jesus, too, when he called Matthew to follow him. When Jesus sat and reclined with tax collectors and sinners. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. Verses, starting at verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. As, and as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Sound familiar? But when he heard it, he said, those are, who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay? So if you're hanging out with people who are quote-unquote sinners, which they are, that's who Jesus was hanging out with. And he got criticized for it too. By who? The righteous. And Jesus is constantly calling out the righteous on this very thing because, because of they were, they were so narrow-minded about their... They were more religious than they did have a relationship with God. They were more about making sure you need to follow this rule to this T. Well, wait a minute. What if you mess up? Is there room for error? Oh, I forgot about this whole forgiveness thing. Right? Jesus says, I want to see you show mercy to people. I want you to show love to people. Jesus responds with, I have come to heal the sick, not the healthy. Right? I desire mercy. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call the sinners. Are we righteous? We need to call in our sinner friends then and get them in here. Because by grace, you are made righteous. You're not perfect, and yes, you still sin, and yes, we still wrestle with sin. But we are, you're, when, when, I, when, when I share the word with you, all of our job, not just mine, but yours too, is to go out and bring people in, invite them to church. Not just to sit here on Sunday morning, but... To, to grasp this salvation that we keep talking about. Right? How did Peter respond? Peter, okay, because here's Peter's friends. They're Jewish believers now following Jesus, but they're of what's called the, the circumcised, what, what did I call that? The, the circumcision party. We are the circumcision party, and you are not part of the club unless you've been properly circumcised. <clears throat> that was a ritual thing. That was a tradition thing. 
Of course, nowadays, everybody is. So it's become a health thing. But for them, it was very, very important because it set them apart from the rest of the world. What sets us apart from the rest of the world? Do we act different than the world? We try. <laughs> we do try. But we still have our same worldly tendencies that we got to battle. But what the circumcision party missed is they, they misunderstood salvation. They thought, if I do all these things, then I'll be saved. But what did Jesus say? Just follow me. Follow me. Follow my lead. And if you don't get what Jesus' lead looks like, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that shows you exactly how Jesus treated people, how he loved people, who he challenged. He challenged guys like me who are up here sharing the word. And I, would, I, I don't dare call myself righteous aside from the fact that I have salvation in Jesus Christ. Because I guarantee I'm, you, you've been around me long enough, you, you know my flaws. You know I'm, I'm rough around the edges. But Jesus still uses people like us. So, now we wrestle with Christian legalism. Our own misunderstood salvation. What are the stipulations that we put on professing believers? Now, we, we try hard not to do this. But this is something we've wrestled with over the years. How you dress. How short your hair is. How long your hair is. Make sure your shoes are polished properly. Make sure you, you never, ever sin. I rem you know, I remember driving to church with my parents, and I remember every single week... They'd be arguing back and forth, and me and my brother would be fighting in the back seat, and it'd be all the way to church. Man, it's like, arr, 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 you did this. You know, because you're trying to get your kids out the door, and <clears throat> that can be a daunting task all on its own. And here's mom and dad arguing. Here's the two kids in the back fighting. And then the minute you pull into that parking lot of the church, though, you're like, Phew. okay. We're going to be nice now. How's everything going? Well, great. Everything's good. We put on our church face to act like everything's just fine. Is that what we're called to do as followers of Jesus? No. I try to make it, I try not to hide anything if I can. You guys know I'm messed up, right? You know I make mistakes. Sometimes I spout off at the mouth and I have to go back and apologize for it. Those words are hard to say. I would much rather just say fuzzy was he was a bear, fuzzy was he had no hair, fuzzy was he was. You know, I would rather just spout that off than have to sometimes go apologize to somebody or say, you know what, I really messed up. That's hard. But when you do that, that's where transformation happens. And that's where you start to see the authenticity of your faith, of following Jesus. Peter learned this through his whole encounter with Cornelius. Okay, I know we've been talking about this for several weeks. But this is so important that Peter learned this that he shared his vision almost word verbatim, because we have it both in chapter 10 and 11, about this vision that God gave to Peter. He shared it with them because he knew how important it was for them to understand that God's got a bigger picture than we can see and that we need to learn how to love one another as Christ loved us. And that it's not just 
for the spiritually elite. It's not just for those who wear their tie or slacks on Sunday. It's for the person who can come in with their jeans and a t-shirt. It's that's the message for you too. We're not different. We are all God's people in this room. We were all created in His image. And there's always hope for change in your heart when you turn to Him. Always hope. You got breath in your lungs. If you're able to say, say the words, there is hope. You have hope. You do. Whatever sin you're wrestling with right now, today, you have hope. There's hope. But you've got to ask Jesus to give you the strength to overcome it, just like I do. I do too. I do too. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Starting at verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. What is Romans telling us? It says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So you're confessing that. You're saying, Jesus is Lord. You are making a proclamation with your mouth. If you really believe that, he's also saying, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Do you really believe this in your heart? Because if you say the words without believing it, what is that? It's just words. You just sound religious. We have to believe this in our hearts when we confess this. Jesus is Lord. I do believe that. I, I believe that with all of my heart. I believe it. I believe it. Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus can change who you are right now? Do you believe that Jesus is going to pull you through whatever you're going through in this moment? Do you really, really, truly believe it? Shout out amen if you believe that. Because he does. He's the one that makes the changes inside of you. I have no idea why I'm crying right now, except that God moves us, and He changes us, and He transforms us. Salvation has nothing to do with how perfect we dress or how perfect you act. I've said this before. There's a lot of jerks that are going to be in heaven, and they're probably one of them. But He can take our jerkiness and transform it and make it something beautiful and something new and restore it and transform it into something far better than we've ever imagined. Do you believe it? It is not about pretending that we have it all together before we get to church. It's not about pretending that you have it all together before you show up through those front doors. Okay, I talked to somebody today who was really hurting. And I had the privilege to pray with them. They didn't put on a show. They didn't put on, hey, everything's great. Everything's fine. No. They're hurting. It was hurting. But because we believe that Jesus is Lord and that He can change our life. He's going to bring us through whatever the challenge is. Yeah, I feel bad for yelling at my kids the other day. 
I'm sure I could have gotten my point across without raising my voice. You know, there's, there's always a better way to do something, right? We're not ever going to get it perfect. But God perfects us through Jesus Christ. And that's where understanding salvation starts to, to come in. Let's stick with our verse in uh, Acts 11, verse 18. It says this, When they heard these things, they fell silent. These are the guys who were going, Hey, you were hanging out with sinners and uncircumcised and... and uh, what were you doing hanging out with those guys, right? They fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Repentance that leads to life. So we've got confessing Jesus with our mouths. That means we are confessing and we are proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we are believing in our hearts that He is the Son of God. Now turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So, what do we need to do for salvation? We need this godly grief. Not worldly grief, but godly grief. Godly grief, that means you are truly broken over the sin in our life. We are broken over the sin in our life and we want to get rid of it or we want to overcome it somehow. That's what godly grief is. It's not just feeling bad that you keep sinning. It's not just feeling bad Man, I did it again. Oh, I'm so horrible. Oh, I'm a terrible person. Oh, I'm never going to get it right. Oh, this is, then you start feeling sorry for yourself. Godly grief is, I want to overcome this. I want to have victory over this. I want to see how God's going to do this. And I want to lean, I need to lean on Him to do that. This godly grief, what does it say? Produces Repentance. This is not just feeling sorry for our sin. Okay? Confessing your sin is saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did this. I really feel bad that I did this. Please forgive me. Okay? But repentance takes it the next step. It is literally turning away from our sin and saying no to it and turning to God to help us overcome it. Does that make sense? Repentance and confession are different. Confession is just admitting that you did something wrong. That's the first step. That's great. But repentance is literally turning around and saying, help me, Lord. I can't do this without you. We cannot overcome our sin without the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. It produces repentance that does not perfect you as a Christian but repentance takes your eyes off yourself and puts them on God repentance takes your eyes off of you and puts your eyes on God this repentance that is produced then what does it say in, in that verse leads to salvation what is salvation just in case, it is deliverance from all that is evil in this world. The state of being, and I love this definite. I, got, I, I looked this up this time, and I said, the, salvation is the state of being in grave danger and so being safe. Mainly from God's wrath. Salvation is is being in grave danger, yet you're safe. I mean, how powerful is that? 
you're in grave danger. But because you have Jesus, you're safe. You are safe from anything that wants to take you away from God. That's how salvation works. So I say salvation for all. Ask Jesus into your heart. Let him into your heart. Let him be the change in you. Anyone can have this. Anyone. If you ask Jesus into your heart and you choose to follow him, he will be the change in you. Without Jesus, it is all I'm sorry, hell, fire, brimstone, all that stuff that we don't want. It's complete separation from God. We don't even know what it's like to be fully, completely separated from God. Because God is still present even when we're still ignoring Him sometimes. He's still around. We don't know what it's like to be completely without God. Do you know who does? Jesus does. When His Spirit left Him on that cross... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew in that moment what it was like to be without God. And he does not want that for any of us. He will be the change in you if you let him. Salvation is open to all who ask Jesus for it. Amen? Amen. Stand if you are able and willing as the worship team leads us in song. If God is pulling on your heart this morning, I invite you to come up while they're singing, and I want to pray with you and help you through that process and start that journey.
If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. If that is not love, if you don't believe what Jesus did on the cross and, and conquering death isn't real, then all of this that I just said is a bunch of malarkey. And it's true. It is. It's, if, I mean, but we believe it because it is true. And it is the truth. It is the Word of God. Because Jesus loves every single last one of you in here. He loves you so much. And, I, and I, it's, even for me some days, I'll look in the mirror when I get up in the morning and go, you really love me? Yes, he does. If you go out this week, share Jesus with somebody. Share, for, ask Jesus to open the door for you to share that same love that you have right now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said...